Hello. It has been a week, more than a week, since I have uh, communicated and last left you a message. And I know that each of you, there are many of you who are struggling. A, a large percentage of our classes have really been struggling, and so I haven't um, put up any more um, extra assignments other than what is absolutely essential for the completion of this course. Um, here I want to include um, this video and probably one more video uh, just to help you. Uh, on Wednesday of next week, your persuasive speech is due. And on Thursday or Friday, I believe, your final exam is due and unfortunately I won't be able to extend any more deadlines because um, because uh, dates are I mean the the end of the trimester is coming up so hopefully you'll be able to uh, catch up any late work and, and meet those two deadlines by this time next week. Anyway, I wanted to cover um, some topics from chapter 11 and chapter 13, talking about using supporting material to strengthen your argument. So um, I'm wanting to incorporate this lesson from analyzing arguments and I think I've talked about the development cycle before but let me reiterate the de development start cycle starts with an idea but it starts with reading and research all right it's very important to do your due diligence in finding the material that you need to build your argument, all right? If you have something you're passionate about, you have something that you already know about, that's great. But um, like we talked about in the section on being honest and doing honest work, it's very important that you give due respect and cite the sources that you're using. And it's very important that you present material with cited sources, okay? So that's going to give credibility and support and strengthening to your arguments that you present. So as you begin studying and reading, you're going to read as a believer, right? You're going to find the you're going to start with the material that you know you're going to start with the authors that you recognize and you're going to build you know your background with that and then you're going to move towards 
reading as a doubter and you're going to ask questions. All right, what is missing from the information that you have presented? What isn't what isn't being discussed here? Uh, then you're going to explore. Um, the kind of the discussion in the field of the topic that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with a, a, a particular topic in healthcare, for example, let me use just an example from um, that's on the tip of everybody's thought process right now. Face masks, right? What are the articles? What are the scientific articles that um, have discussed the use of face masks. Um, the CDC at first said don't use them. Then they said only um, healthcare professionals should use them. And now they're saying that everyone should use them. What kind of materials should they be made of? Right? What articles suggest that certain materials are more proper than other materials? Um, you know, so you can give your opinion, and that's great. Even as a healthcare worker, you can use um, the things that you are trained to use and the things that you have learned from on the job, and that's great. But that's only a part of the process, right? You also should support your um, the things that you know with citations from authorities all right and so these supporting materials should be presented in a cohesive way you use them as examples you use them as citations inclu included in quotation marks and obviously you're telling a story um all your story shouldn't be first person, right? I did this and I did that, but rather it should be someone else also did some things and explain how those those things that they did contributed to the broader picture in the issue, right? What did the CDC say? Who at the CDC said that? What did the study at MIT say? What did the study at Stanford say, right? What did the study at Harvard Medical say? And weaving those things in together to form a more complete story is going to be um, very essential and is going to help your audience create a bigger picture. It also is going to um, show you, it is also going to build your credibility as an authority, as someone who has done the research, someone that knows what they're talking about. Um, by presenting also seeking out alternative viewpoints right so present the even evidence that you don't agree with you know you need to address that because there are going to be people in your audience who are thinking those alternative views who are thinking those opposing um uh, viewpoints and so by you incorporating them into your speech and then answering those questions based on um, the evidence that you've gathered, you're going to give a well-rounded picture. Using disagreement productively to prompt you to do further investigation. That's the last, that's the final step there, right? Um, maybe the alternative views raised an issue that you're just not comfortable with, right? Why are you not comfortable with that? What can you do differently? Um, or what can you find out that will help put some of these questions in your own mind and heart to rest? And if you have a question about, about that, I'm sure someone in your audience is also going to have that question. And so being able to cont uh, follow that curiosity, that um, disagreement, that thinking outside the box and using that to stimulate your own research is going to be very important. Um, this ties right back into the session that we talked about on Toolman's philosophy, right? Um, you, you gather information, you use grounds 
You know, you give an, a reason for, um, and that's called grounds when it is an audience that agrees with you, right? All they need is a little hook to hang their belief on, right? That's grounds. But if you have an audience that is antagonistic, that is um, at the very least um, skeptical or unconvinced, then you need to go a little bit deeper and Toulmin calls it backing, right? You need to have some more, some, some arguments, some evidence with more teeth in them that is going to um, help overcome the skepticism and the, and the bias of the other person. An analogy is always helpful in that arena. Analogy is being able to take an example, take evidence that you've experienced, take um, examples from real life, whether you, whether you um, and ex examples can come in many forms, right? They can come from your life. They can come from the life of someone you know. They can come from the life of a famous person. So you can use someone else's biography uh, for an example, they can come from um, white papers that explain the process of experimentation, right? And so from these experiments, then we can draw analogies on how they apply, right? For example, um, back in the end of or the middle of March, when me and my wife began um, explore understanding what was happening in the world and We've been, um, I personally have been um, kind of watching uh, the development of COVID-19 since November and knew that it was a, a, a world issue. And as a international traveler, I, you know, and traveling to Europe and seeing, you know, and having friends in, in Italy and things like that, um, seeing the trajectory of the development of this situation, I'd already been reading a lot of the um, scientific research and white papers. So they were talking about, you know, what are the environments in which the 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 virus um, can sustainably live? You know, whether it is plastics or um, stainless steel or copper or um, aerosols. You know, so those kinds of things that that evidence was already there by the first of March, except that. Most people didn't read it, you know, and didn't understand it and didn't understand how that would apply to face masks until here, you know, the end of, of April, two months later. So having that kind of information already, you know, we were much more careful with our plastics because it can survive up to 72 hours on plastics, right? Um, something that's made out of silver or copper or, you know, semi-precious metals that has a built-in um uh antibodies you know it's not an issue they uh, the virus just doesn't survive but stainless steel it would survive um 24 hours things like cardboard it was very is varied right it could be eight hours it could be uh 48 hours um so a lot of different variables there and then aerosols it's at least three hours three hours, that means that if you're passing through an environment where someone who is sick has already passed through within the last three hours, you have the potential of, um, of inhaling those aerosols and becoming um, airborne contaminated at that point, right? So face masks is a, a no-brainer whenever you understand the analogy from the experimentation that's already been done. So supporting your persuasive speech with evidence is extremely important. Um, I've talked a little bit about Aristotle and Plato. Remember how, how Aristotle believed that you could look at the particulars, the specific things in the earth, you know, and study them in if you get enough of the particular experimentation together, and he was, it was his thinking that's behind the scientific method, right? Um, through experimentation, we can 
get enough evidence together, put the pieces together, and we can create a general idea of what what the um, what physics and metaphysics is cre is made of, right? Whereas Plato believed that you had to start with the logos, right? You start with the the true. You start with the um, the supreme, and and by understanding the supreme, then the specifics come into focus from that. And as Christians, we see the benefit of both. But we certainly, um, because we have, you know, been given the uh, the revelation of God, the specific revelation of God, the the general, the big picture from the scriptures, then we're able to understand the specifics within a certain paradigm or within a certain um, viewpoint. So, um admitting and recognizing this bias and this perspective is extremely important in creating a an argument you know do does your audience agree with you on the general do do they come from a point of absolute truth if they don't then what is the common ground that you have perhaps you're going to have to start from um, a specific point in which y'all both can agree and build your argument out from by analogy from a specific. But if they are at least admitting that there is a God, that he created all things, you know, um, that's where Paul went with, with the people there in Athens whenever he went to Greece. And he preached there on the Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. He said, God that created all things. You know, whether they agreed with that or not, I mean, they at least had that tradition and they gave lip service to the fact that God created all things. He says, why is that such a surprising thing that he could raise from the dead if he created life? Right. So he used um, the general, the platonic view and then um uh, and then built his argument to the specific a aspect of the fact that Jesus himself was raised from the dead. He was the resurrected Son of God. So those are two different kinds of um, strategies for developing an argument. Remember that um, the last point that Tolman made was what he called the qualifier. The qualifier. And that is because as humans, we can have the scriptures. And absolutely, we believe the scriptures. Um, we are blessed above, beyond description for having the scriptures. And yet at the same time, as finite humans... We have to be a little bit humble about our ability to interpret or even understand everything that is in the scriptures, right? So our building of arguments is not going to be 100% unequivocal, right? It's going to be a degree of probable truth in which we strengthen the arguments of what we believe based on our ability to perceive and understand. And so the qualifier is, you know, I believe this, or I think, or it seems to me, or based on research, I have, you know, based on these are the examples that I have seen. So that qualifier means that you don't have all knowledge, that you don't... um you know, pretend to be all truth, but that you have this much truth, the amount of truth that you're presenting as evidence, and based on that, then you're presenting your argument, right? Um, for example, the again, going back to the experiments that we were talking about, um, what was the percentage of virus uh, viability within those different media, 
right? What was the percentage of viability within the aerosols? Um, it's not 100%, right? And it's not forever. It's limited, right? It's um, it, The amount of viability of, of viruses in aerosols um, extends for three for three hours and then the the percentage of viability goes down dramatically from there so you have this range it's not to say that one virus might survive four hours or five hours or um some virus some strain of the virus might only survive an hour it's giving a range based on percentages Right. And that's where the qualifier comes in, being able to understand and appreciate and deal with the limitations of the of, of the um, evidence that we have. Right. Seventy five percent of instances blank, blank, blank. Right. So be sure to be as accurate as possible with using the qualifiers and use and, and that's where. I mean, you're going to build uh, credibility with your audience if they can trust that you're going to be as accurate as possible with what you know and what you have explored and researched. Also, be careful the kinds of um, examples that you use, that they be um, examples that are appropriate to the topic that you're dealing with. Um, that they be, you know, strong enough in scope and so on. And the way the qualifier works is with um, one of my favorite topics to study is the modal auxiliary verb, the modal auxiliary verb. And this is, um, if we were to, if we were to um, create a modal auxiliary verb, it would be, um, some of y'all may have memorized these as kids, right? Um, shall, will, should, would, may, might, may, might, must, can, could. Those are our modal auxiliary words, right? And particularly should, would, may, might are very essential in dealing with a qualifier, right? It's, it's great to say that something could happen or something should happen. That doesn't, that that's not a hundred percent guarantee that it will happen that way, right? Shall and will are reserved for God alone. You know, He alone knows the future. And um, in some languages, in some countries, they they refuse to express anything in such certainties, right? Whenever they talk in the future, they would much prefer to say it might happen, it may happen. It should happen, or it would happen, or it could happen, right? So they prefer um, to use and um, an example of the modal forms in, for example, in Spanish or in Portuguese, is a case called the subjunctive. The subjunctive means that um, it is an indirect statement. Um, it builds into the phrasing of the language this possibility that it couldn't it may not happen right it could happen but it may not not may is a present tense modal might is a past tense modal it might have been that way it might have happened and so um if we have reasons or grounds to justify this claim, that's great, but be sure to learn how to use your modal helping verbs in expressing um, that it is not 100% possible, right?
So experimentation is to rule out certain suppositions and try to build it on evidence. But again, evidence can only take you so far. And then, um, kind of coming full circle back around, whenever we are um, It is okay for you in building your case to build it on um, things that aren't cannot be scientifically proven, right? We've talked about this. Science can only go so far in supporting evidence. Science can't tell you everything there is. So... There are different kind of criteria that people adhere to and actually that are a lot stronger for them many times than scientific evidence. You have to have evidence. You need to have, you know, a reasonable sense of how the world operates. You need to have common sense. But at the same time, there are aspects that appeal to us as humans much more moral judgments, right? What do we believe is right and wrong? So it goes back to our beliefs um, and what is true, what we believe is true, our um, culture and our opinions. Something like aesthetics. I, I am fascinated by the study of aesthetics. You know, what is beauty? What is beautiful? Some people say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Yes to a certain extent, but there are some things that everybody can look at and say, hey, that's beautiful, right? And then other things that um, just doesn't strike us as beautiful. And many times, um, like a whole culture considers one thing beautiful, but people outside that culture really don't get it, right? They don't appreciate the beauty in that particular thing um, if they're not kind of steeped and indoctrinated in that thinking, in that, in that way of seeing the world. And so, uh, you have to take the, um, these kind of criteria into account when you're persuading, right? Do you agree with your audience on what is beautiful? Um, it's easy for you to say, oh, well, anybody can see that's a beautiful painting. But, I mean, if you're looking at, a, for example, a Picasso, no, everybody doesn't, can't obviously see that that is beautiful. Um, there, um, there is a process of training and learning in which you can see the beauty and the, the, the real um, the real genius in Picasso's style of, of painting that doesn't occur to you um, for someone who is uninitiated or unaware. Same thing with jazz. My wife is a, a, a jazz pianist and some people don't get jazz. They think it's, um, it's just weird and goes all over the place. But jazz has a certain process that um, to me is very appealing and um, I really enjoy um, watching, ja uh, listening to jazz. And it's, but even the, you know, the esoteric, the cerebral kind of jazz, uh, I really dig. Um, so think about how you're going to be able to support your um your speech and that brings me to the second part in chapter 13 using illustrations right so if you're going to use statistics um be sure that you're um use graphs 
use pie gra charts or use bar graphs or use um, graphic equalizers that will give your audience an opportunity to see what is significant about those statistics, right? To compare them, they have to see, okay, what is normal and what is heightened. Uh, for example, everybody has talked about, you know, flattening the curve, flattening the curve. What are you talking about? We're talking about how fast coronavirus is growing. Um, you know, what is the exponential growth of it? And at what point can that be um, lessened? Uh, and so if, if given a, an, a given a visual, then it makes a lot more sense to your audience to see if they could see a um, a you know the bell curve of the growth of a pandemic, then it would make more sense. And you know those statistics are available. Those uh, those graphs are available, right? You can go back and see graphs for the pandemic growth of different major cities from the 1918 pandemic, right? You can see how Chicago had one spike and then Lesson had a second lesser spike before, um, before the pandemic was brought under control. You can see other cities that had a different response um, had a, a much less severe spike. And, and so um, by looking at the graph, the graph helps your audience. Um, I love show and tell, right? If um, if you're describing a um, a jujitsu move, um, ask for a volunteer and show them how to do the grappling hold. That that view, that personal proximity, helps the audience much more than just using words. Obviously, words are extremely powerful. We use them all always. They are magical. They can create imaginations in the um, in the hearer's mind that that um, conveys very vividly the kinds of and information that you're wanting to share. But at the same time, a well placed uh, visual aid is going to make a huge difference in your audience's ability to perceive. That's why I use slides. I don't use them as effectively as I could or should, but having the bullet points in front of you helps you follow the, my train of thought um, whenever I tend to veer off um, course at times in my presentations. So visual aids are an extremely important part and I definitely recommend. They're not a requirement on your last speech, but they definitely are an enhancement to your last speech. All right, so take that into consideration. Um, and so that for this particular um, lecture, I'm going to leave it there covering um, in general terms, chapters 11 and 13.